Welcome to the Fashion Bunker. I'm dressed very dark today, well, as dark as I could be, considering that I'm wearing Jeremy Scott for Adidas. Pretty old piece with a lot of uh, tassels falling all over it, I mean, attached to it. So, um, anyway, uh, the occasion being a review of a very, very dark, deep, and... Hmm meditative, perhaps not, baroque is the right word, fragrance. So uh, today is fragrance review time, and we're talking about Dior's Privé Au Noir. Let's come as close as possible. There you have it. Now, this is the Cologne, as you can see on the bottle. This was the first rendition of Au Noir, um, 2004, approximately the year of release, uh, Hedy Sliman designed the bottles of the first three colognes in the Privé line, which were Au Noir, Cologne Blanche, and Bois d'Argent. Available in 125, 250, and 400 to 500 ml. This one is a spray that you can unscrew. I'm not going to do it now because this bottle is a bit old. Oh, it works. And then you could just take off the spray and put on the stopper for the splash. So that was amazing back then. Today they don't do that anymore. Anyway, um, this is a 250 milliliter spray bottle. Back in the day, you know, they used to cost way less. Uh, it was around 125 to 145 euro for 250 milliliter. Now you got to pay over 300 euro for 250 milliliter spray bottles of not Eau de Cologne, but Eau de Parfum, even though the Eau de Cologne is as intense, if not even more intense than the Eau de Parfum, at least to my nose. With Onwa, it's the same situation. Onwa is kind of an interesting thing. You know, Cologne Blanche has been discontinued uh, for uh, the preference of the Cologne Royale. Now, Cologne Blanche was not made by Demachy. And neither is Eau Noir. And Eau Noir, interestingly enough, is not available usually at the Dior counters that sell the Privé line. You can order it, however. This is usually the case. And again, it's one of those, to me, just stinks of wanting to kind of push something away as much as possible unless you don't demand it and then they give it to you just because the maker is not Demachy. But, and I'm, I always have difficulties pronouncing his name, so I apologize really, guys. Uh, Kurgian? Oh, God. I wish I knew how to pronounce his name. I mean, Francis is easy, but Cork, Cork Gian, Cork, Cork Gian, Gian. Anyway, he made the Le Mal uh, perfume. He is also um, somehow involved in uh, Bois d'Argent, but Bois d'Argent is so popular. It's the most famous of the Privé line, so they couldn't just discontinue that one. Onoir, however, is incredible. It is a perfume that... I mean, I don't have much left. This is the first original formulation. Uh, I kind of, you know, put it from this bottle into these tinier 20 milliliter spray bottles that I get uh, in uh, pharmacies. That's how I do it. Um, another interesting thing is these bottle, these containers are made to contain these bottles where they don't have the spray, but when they have their stopper, which is a bit lower. I didn't know that. So when I was traveling, actually when I was moving once, I left the spray on and just put it in, the, in, in this container and sealed it. Well, guess what? It slightly pressed the spray, hence uh, the leakage. And oh boy, is there a lot of leakage in here. I don't know if you can see what happened, but it even changed the color. You can see, I bet you can see inside. I can't because I'm too far away from the camera, but you can see all of this kind of tainted colorway. Uh, it was slowly leaking out. Well, thank God after a couple of hours I noticed it. And what I did was there's a little sponge down here. Uh, I took that sponge out, the sponge that kind of softens the floor. And now I have enough space in here to, uh, you know, preserve my bottle this way. Interesting little story. And it looks very vintage and used now, and I love this shading of yellow on the bo on the box. So, let's spray it out of its travel container. 
Now, mind you, whoa, it's so intense. I use this fragrance mostly in winter, but I have rediscovered it for myself lately. Why? Because I am a huge fan and believer in sage, the power and miracle of sage. I love to drink sage tea. I love to inhale sage. I, I even have like drops to disinfect the, the throat and, and just like the, your entire respiratory system. Sage to me is literally the plant that more than any other plant just delivers so much happiness, joy, and just kind of cleanses my spirit. I have the feeling it's like a spirit cleanser, a soul cleanser. This one opens up with sage. Mm, my God, it's delicious. So, um, top notes. Uh, let's see. So, we got uh, thyme. And um, middle notes, coffee, Virginia, cedar, lavender. Base notes, licorice, vanilla, violet, leather. Now, in the opening notes, I, as I said in the beginning, we also have sage. Now, also fresh anise. There's like anise in there as well. The anise kind of le lets the licorice levitate a little because what you do sense out immediately, that healthy spirituality of the sage, and then you sense the licorice, and then you the more this perfume goes, I mean, the lavender is there throughout the entire composition, but in fact, back in 2004, five, six, when did I buy this one? Around 2005 or six. Um, this one did not have its counter, well, counterpart. I wouldn't call it a counterpart. It didn't have that devil fighting against this one. You know, it didn't have its nemesis, which to me is Jersey by Chanel, as far as lavender goes, because Jersey... To me, well, to me, Onoir was the purest, that element of lavender in there was the purest lavender I ever smelled. Until Jersey came along. And now Jersey, to me, is the essence of lavender. Especially Jersey in pure parfum form. Um, Onoir comes very close, but it's not as pure as uh, the lavender in, in Jersey, in Chanel's Exclusives Jersey. However, the lavender here is divine. And the woodsy notes are divine. The licorice is divine. There is a hint of violet there as well, but it never really comes to shine as the violet would shine as a violet candy in, let's say, um, Misia by Chanel. But nevertheless, the violet is here as well. Now, this green liquid, I mean, the the perfume is called Eau Noir, so like black water. Um, it's not black. It's It's green. It's a very dark. It's a poison green. And don't get fooled by this green. This is not the type of green that a Chanel 19 would deliver. You know, there's no like Chypre, uh, Chypre um, greeny note in here. This green is supposed to resemble a green that's turning black, that's going into a poisonous realm. And we know that Christian Dior also, uh, you know, created the poison perfume. So it's kind of like shifting into that territory, not smell wise, more concept wise, not just that, but also we have that Baroque touch and the Baroque in the best of ways. We're not talking Baroque paintings. We're not talking about Caravaggio uh, Medusa heads chopped off or or um, uh, young, you know, guys kind of just in these really, really uh, affected poses. We're talking about wood. We're talking about dark, wooden, intense, expensive wooden floors in, in rich, opulent houses from the Baroque time. Uh, we are talking about wooden floors that are imported from faraway lands. We're talking about Venice. We're in Venice, perhaps in some rich, decadently, opulently rich house from one of those um, merchants from, from Venice from back in the day that were extremely rich, that would import woods from, from the Orient or from far, far away. And those woods would smell very particular. They would be such exotic woods. And those woods would then be lacquered and prepared to be used as flooring. And now when you would enter those rooms, they, they would just, you would inhale those magical smell of those woods. Now imagine one of those houses and those dark floors by accident burning. But the owner catches the fire on time and manages to kind of you know, turn it off, the fire and the flames, and what is left is a resinous residue of the smell of the resins and the woods and that smoky fire 
that flame that has been extinguished but makes the wood smell smoked. That intensity and depth of that darkness when that wood turns even darker because it burned, that's the blackness of this liquid, of this water. And that's how Baraka can get, how mesmerizingly Baraka can get. And mind you, don't imagine and envision this floor. Let me spray it again. Don't envision this floor. It's so intense, uh, but let me just spray it a lot. Don't envision this floor as a photo. Don't use photographic memory. Instead, envision it as if you were Caravaggio or another Baroque painter, and you are painting with thick, rich, pigmented oils this painting. You're painting this floor. The darkness of the floor, the crevices of the floor, the residue of the burnt of the floor, the depth of it, you know, kind of the, the pores and the veins. I call them veins of the floor. When you would cut a tree, you could kind of see the circles, kind of how many circles it has is like they say the age of the tree and, and, and its lifespan. Well, if envision that you're painting every single detail with intoxicatingly rich and pigmented oils that, that are probably going to need half a year to dry once the painting is set. And then half a year later, you come back to that painting and you look at the floor that you've painted. And that wooden Baroque floor is painted with what light? You don't have artificial light. We're talking Baroque times. Like there's candlelight and there's daylight. And all that you get are rays of, of light kind of filtering through a window. And yet the room is dusty. So you have those particles of dust slowly moving in the air. And that those couple of rays of light, of warm yellow rays of light hitting that floor, the dark, intoxicatingly, orientally, exotically smelling floor. And you're painting that. You're painting more the shadows than the light. The light makes things almost go invisible because it, it lights everything up. But you're painting like a very savvy uh, Baroque painter. You're painting the shadows. You're painting what's invisible. Because you want the spectator looking at your painting to be able to use their imagination, and that's also the Stendhal syndrome, you want them to be able to fall into that painting. You want them to fall into that darkness. You want them to envision what it is that the painter painted in the corners and the shadows and the mists of that painting. We got the center with the light illuminating the central part of the painting, and we see the floor with the crevices, and we see the bits of burnt floor, and yet spreading out on the sides of that painting is darkness. And that darkness is, is what stimulates our fantasy even more than the light. And exactly that darkness is au noir. Exactly that darkness, where that blackness hits the light, and right in between is that fade into total blackness and darkness. That's when, when, when Onoir hits you and permeates you. It's balsamic, it's dangerous, it's sweet. There's no bitter in there. Maybe there's a hint of almonds, but I don't really sense them out. And you have those woods. There's that sandal as well. As well. So you, you get this kind of sage, spiritual, elevated light. And, and then you get the licorice that kind of is, becomes light that's cloying and it starts dragging you down into those shadows. And then you get the woods and then you get the sandal and then you get... And strangely enough, the violet, even though it's a flower that grows in the sun, that violet to me tickles out a certain nuance of the licorice and, and, and of the sandalwood that kind of, to me, cr makes it go even darker but layered. It's like a layered darkness. When you thought there's just blackness and darkness, no. Because this particular oil painting, and the darkness in this particular oil painting, triggers memory patterns in your head, triggers fears, triggers also security patterns, and makes you just feel layers of darkness. And all of a sudden, the real eyes, the internal eyes, not these two, but the ones inside of you, your soul kind of opens up and start seeing the layers of darkness in this painting and the layers of, of and hues of blackness in, in this magical, magical black water. Um, to me, it is a Baroque painting, an oil, intense pigmented oil of a black floor with the ray of light hitting one spot and the rest fading into black.
And that's all it is. Really, that's all it is. And there's just the magic of your imagination. And boy, does this one stimulate it. It's one of Francis's best perfumes, in my personal opinion. I know that he has his own range and his own perfumes. He doesn't just do perfumes for big brands, but does his own. And the range is amazing. And a lot of you have also uh, uh, written me also many times how much you love those. And nevertheless, there's a certain poetry about this perfume. And mind you, it came also in a time where... You know, Hedy Sliman was a head designer of uh, Dior Homme prêt poter of the range. Karl Lagerfeld said to have lost all his chubbiness and weight just to be able to fit into that skinny look uh, by Hedy Sliman. And in fact, Hedy Sliman, that is now, well, he left uh, Saint Laurent, but, uh, you know, Lagerfeld just wore um, a Saint Laurent outfit, jacket, suit, I think it was like sequin or pellets over it. Uh, as he, you know, finished and closed his own Chanel show, uh, the cruise collection Paris Cuba. So there's a huge kind of circulation of about Hedy Sliman and the envisionment of his kind of obsession with these skinny, 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 bony, 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 uh, young, young, young boys wearing these expensive clothes and this kind of slim look. And that whole movement of these boys that usually had the rock touch to them, long hair, that's the period when this perfume came out. As a contrast to that kind of rocky touch, this baroque touch. And boy, were the early 2000s with Dior um, amazing, amazing. Um, and this perfume describes that era to a T. And yes, I say era because it is over. We don't have that sort of vibe going on anymore nowadays. But nevertheless, we still have that baroque painting hanging somewhere on one of the walls inside our souls and inside, inside our memories. And as I say also often in a lot of perfume reviews, you just need to find that key to trigger that certain memory pattern, to unlock that certain door, open it up. And once it's open inside your soul, it's open for good and you know how to access it later on. How? By triggering it throughout certain perfumes. And this one does have a lot of triggers in it, according to me. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. It's magical. There's nothing like it out there, really. Um, you know... Demachi tries to say that there's a licorice in Hypnotic Poison Eau de Parfum. No, there isn't. There's like a cherry, syrupy cherry in there. Francis, however, in the Dior Au Noir Cologne, created the licorice that, that, that makes you feel heat. And if I were British, as British as I could be, I can't do the British accent. You know how they pronounce the t t t t t it, I can't really... Heat, like you, I would need to cut, you know, heat with a t that, that that literally is like a razor. It's razor sharp and it cuts right through you. That's a type of heat that the licorice has within Onwa. Once you have found your own personal way, and once you have unlocked your own door to that special room covered with velvets, dark velvets, green velvets, and moiré fabrics. You know, tapestries and, and these, these, also these, um, these velvets covering the walls of this room. And there's this like chaise lounge also in velvet in the middle of the room facing a wall. And once you found that room, you will discover that once you lay yourself on that chaise lounge and you look straight forward in front of you, right on that wall, is going to be that minuscule, it's not a big painting, this big. You will look into it and you will see a painting of that floor from some other memory and some other vision. And you will access it through the Stendhal syndrome and you will fall into that painting. And you will be surrounded by all this darkness. And for the first time, perhaps in your life, you won't be really afraid of that particular darkness because all of a sudden you will be completely surrounded by au noir and that au noir will make you feel like you can conquer and live within any darkness without fear. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you like this review. And if you ever did try au noir, uh, I hope you love it as much as I do. This one was definitely worth this really, really intense journey that I just went through. I hope you enjoyed it with me. Thumb it up if you did. Let me know what you think about Au Noir, uh, the Cologne, as well as the Eau de Parfum, if you have it. And uh, please subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. I am also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Don't forget, no matter what poisons are surrounding you, no matter what darkness is shrouding your vision, 
don't ever give up on love, guys. Love you. Bye.